So welcome. I welcome you to the 11th Yousef Helm Engage today on coaching, our final one for this year. A warm welcome to everyone here in the Zoom room and especially a warm welcome to our esteemed speakers who I introduce in a minute. In this Engage, we examine the role of coaching, its impact and relevance, the difference to mentoring and advising and therapy, and how it has achieved such a claim in accelerating change in higher education. We will hopefully also raise some issues on how some of these support avenues like coaching or mentoring, if done only in an in-house or internal way to organize, internal to organizations, might deepen institutional culture rather than challenge it. We also look at how coaching is different from other support and development areas, uh, avenues, and how it is used, sometimes perhaps in problematic ways, in performance management, for instance. So coaching is about a deconstruction of what is in the here and now, and finding new ways of being and seeing the world. We hope you walk away today with a good sense of what it is, and hopefully, too, that you're encouraged to engage in a coaching relationship and a coaching conversation yourself. So now to our speakers. I will intro, introduce all three speakers and then each speaker will hand over to the next one and then we have a discussion and I encourage you to please share in chat and post as many questions as you can or as you want to and we will have time at the end to discuss these. So our first speaker is Dr. Paddy Pampalis, who's the founder director and the faculty head of the Integral Africa Institute and the Coaching Center and co-founder of the Ubuntu Coaching Foundation. Paddy co-directed the Integral African Conference in 2019, a multidisciplinary and integrative gathering of theorists and practitioners focused on hashtag doing human better, I love that, in work and life. Paddy and her team work internationally with leaders. She's motivated by the intent on growing self, others, systems, and cultures towards a more inclusive, holistic, and consciously thriving world. Since her doctorate, she's been a leading figure in the coaching and development psychology field. She's a global team coach supervisor with the GTCI, founding member of Comensa, member of ICF, and accredited board member of the World Association of Business Coaches, and she's HBCSA registered. Paddy, thank you for sharing with us today. And Paddy will be then followed by Sharon, Dr. Sharon Munyaka. Sharon is an organizational psychologist working across South Africa and beyond. She holds a doctorate in industrial psychology from Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. She's a registered organizational psychologist with the Health Professions Council of South Africa and has over 20 years experience in positively transforming behavior in the workplace and in other contexts. She has worked across multiple industries and works at an individual, team, and organizational level. She's been supporting leadership teams to create focus and productivity in uncertain and complex times, especially now in response to the global coronavirus pandemic. Sharon offers different strategies to support learners in managing the mental, emotional, and physical well being of staff and colleagues across job levels. Sharon has facilitated coaching conversations in South Africa, in South African organizations, industry and institutions, in many different kinds of institutions, organizations and companies, and has successfully coached them towards their goals. Sharon, we also look forward to hearing from you. And then our final speaker is Professor Denise Zinn, and like the previous two, is well known and loved by many of us here. Professor Denise Zinn is the Helm Program Leader for the Women in Leadership Program. Previously, she was the Deputy Vice Chancellor Teaching and Learning at NMU, Nelson Mandela University. And before that, she served for two terms as the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Education, first at University of Fort Hare and then at um, Mandela University. She has spent at least three decades in higher education in South Africa after completing a master's and doctorate in education at Harvard University's Graduate School of Education in the USA. 
She was and is on numerous boards and has edited and published a range on a range of issues and has got many publications. Thank you, Denise. You will bring our presentation to an end and then we have a discussion and I look forward to the many questions that you will post in chat and we'll discuss these at the end. So just for your noting, we're hopefully finishing at quarter past three today. So it's a little bit longer than usual. Paddy, I hope you're ready. It's over to you. And um, Patrick, you can spotlight Paddy. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Bridget. And hello to the panel. Um, as always, we've had beautiful encounters in the past. And I've had some wonderful encounters with um, some of you who might be in the room before and um, just looking forward to this really passionate about higher education and what we can do as Bridget said to do human better um, we're not making such a good job of it so far so um, I think well some some are trying very hard but generally when we look at our systems and our experience and the pressures that are here um, I think we've got a real call. There's a real call. Um, there's an advert in um, CNN that says um, is working with the ecological wisdom, and it's there's a I don't know who they're focusing on, but it's a call to Earth, and I love that tagline because there is a call to us as educators. There's a call to us as human beings to really engage in this work that we've been put on 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 the Earth for. And one of our passions, I know there's a richness of, of lots of other things in the, in the room here, but one of our passions is really around education and how do we empower others. So talking about coaching is going to, to hopefully inspire you to see this as something that um, can liberate our intelligence that can work with changing mindsets, can work with opening our hearts, can work with our soul connections and being able to really connect to people in the ways that they need. So I'm going to share some slides with you as I talk. I'm, I'm visual. I like if I was in the room with you, I'd be drawing on a screen or, or getting you to move and do some things. So um, Let's see what happens with our visual shares. So let me just get it up and open on the introductory slide. And I hope you can all see that. Perfect, thanks. So there's something about making sense in today's world of leadership in our education and just simply being a human being for me being a mother <laughs> even though my children are adult i'm still trying to find the way to do that in the most skillful way that i can be and when we're in the busyness of the lives that we have which is actually um, an addiction or a, an illness i think we are just far too busy there's something that's got to break. There's something that's got to move. There's something that's got to shift. And I know for myself that I don't shift until somebody really holds a mirror up for me to say, actually, this is what you're doing. And I often will give them the response of, oh my gosh, I know I'm doing that, but my behaviors don't change. Because actually I don't know. I know cognitively what is happening with me. But there's so much more to this human beingness that has to be incorporated for us to actually make shifts from something that is really comfortable where we we simply want to, you know, continue being the way we are. We've got to hope that we will change or shift or have that conversation or make that decision or start a project. And yet busyness comes in and we're back to doing what we usually do. So these four um, parts of, of my slide, you know, the four pictures there with Helm at the top, Helm is the organization structure that is working to engage all of you. So I want you to notice that because we will come back to it. So how are we having 
conversations that can really deepen insight and have impact. Some of the things that we spoke about, you know, why coaching and which coaching and which coach and how do you manage this? I love the art by Gaia Orion. I met her a number of years ago and she speaks straight to my heart and my soul in the work that she does. I mean, this picture for me, I don't know what it does for you, but if you've got a pen there, I would, or if you want to just put it in the chat, I just park your immediate response to this let's just have a a couple of words in the chat single words what does this bring to mind when you see this picture giving you 30 seconds to do that before i influence your mind so you're already thinking when i ask you something like that you're already thinking you wait a moment because the process has to settle down inside of you before you respond in the chat if you have or not. If I interrupt that process too soon and give you what I've been thinking, already I have influenced your process and it becomes my thinking in your head. Now imagine how we are doing this all the time when we do not have time to wait for people to think when we do not have time the busyness syndrome to actually reflect or take time to listen and to listen beyond words so when we see something and when we experience something really being able to look at its first level and then go deeper and see well what else can i see in this picture oh and what else? And what else? And actually, this is my view. And then a question comes up. Well, what else could you have noticed around this? And then something else expands. So already we're having a very different conversation to the normal conversations that we have in everyday life. And this is what coaching is really about. Having those conversations that can help us interrogate our own thinking, actually challenge our own thinking pathways to say that's good and what else? So it's something like a photographer when you're looking at um, a scene, you know, you can take a quick snap as many of us do on our um phones and we've having a wonderful experience we take a step we want to remember it and it's a little bit blurred it hasn't quite caught the the essence of what we were feeling or we can actually take a moment and we can look around and we can say well what is the best way to come to this photograph how am i going to get into my viewer's eye into the other's eye, the other's mood, to be able to see what lies in their possible recognition of what I'm trying to communicate. So we get into moving ourselves out of the comfort position of just taking the snap as we go along, but maybe getting down on our knee, maybe looking to the side, maybe turning around, looking at it from different lenses. So a great opportunity to say, well, what is it that we actually do for coaching and what kinds of coaching can we talk about? I'm going ahead of myself and my animation slides. So there are many things and many kinds of coaching programs that you may be exposed to and all of them have a place, but they don't offer the same things. So when we're talking about you getting to know what coaching is, it's going to be very interesting for you to explore, well, is, is it an offer of tools and a skills training? All very good. Is it an offer of a model plus skills and tools? Well, that's all very well as well. Or does it include frameworks? All very well. Or does it go deeper to include all the above plus a philosophical approach and what is that philosophical approach 
And then does it take it even deeper to really engage all of those things above and more? And also, not just as information that is being given to us, but as real transformational learning when the very fiber of our being is shifted. I know Sharon's going to talk a little bit more to transactional and transitional and transformational work. And those kind of things are differentiated in who is the coach and where did they train as a coaching. So why is waking up? Why is having a coaching conversation such a good idea? Sometimes it isn't. But the range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And because we fail to notice that, we fail that, that which we fail to, fail to notice, there is little we can change until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds. So we do not usually, if I ask you the question and um, you can also share with us how much reflective time you put into your, your day. But when we are really pressurized, when do we step back and ask ourselves those questions of what did I notice and what did I fail to notice? So there's something about building our awareness, building our inside, clearing out some of our blind spots, opening up to real considerations of others' conversations and to their potential for learning, and then being able to embody all of that which we're hoping to elicit out of others inside of ourselves. That's a big ask. So when we do and I'm talking from our kind of our program at the coaching center, and I've, I know some of you have um, worked with it, and it's really not to say any other means is better or worse. I can just speak for what we do with some insight into many other programs. The thing that is important is the purpose for your coaching, or if you're interested in learning how to coach, what are the skills and what are the processes that you want? That is important for who can help you to do the kind of thinking you want in. So if you want to know how to do a project, well, you can get something that is done very quickly, quickly, short term. I mean, not hurried in the moment, but with the spaciousness of getting you towards something that has a particular outcome. But if you want to cultivate and develop yourself as a human being to actually be the instrument of change. That those around you don't actually have to listen to you, but they can see what you're already being. Then that's a different kind of process. So in this process of really working with transformational learning, and including other kinds of learning. I'm going to just mention that the difference between um, a coaching process and another kind of conversation, they all have value. It's the different qualities of the value that they all have. A management performance conversation can be enhanced by coaching questions and coaching skills. But a coaching process is something about you being able to partner with another human being in a way that I don't think many of us have ever been partnered. So let's explore something. We've run a, a series called What Does It Take to Become a Good Ancestor? And it was a fascinating con set of conversations. When we're thinking of being so involved and, oh my gosh, I've got this project, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through today? There's so much on that I've been asked to do. There's so many challenges in the education system, in our country, in the world. When do we still down and what is the most important aspect or um, capacity that we can manage? That is our internal space our leadership presence. 
because that impacts the leadership behavior, the culture, and the organizational impact. And I do not think leadership can be a single story anymore. It cannot be a hierarchical set up there. It is going to have to be a cooperative venture between many of us who can all bring our gifts to this complex world. And in that, I think we are having to learn a different way of being with each other and learn to have different kinds of conversations. So the United Nations has um, worked with 17 sustainability goals for I don't know how long. And they kind of woke up a year or so ago to the fact that actually not many of these 17 sustainability goals were actually attained. Hallelujah. There's been a group of us who've been involved. It's been um, steered from Sweden. But there's a group of us that have been involved in actually cultivating the inner development goals. Why? Because unless we change the inside, we don't get a shift on the outside. Simple mathematics. Unless, and you can change things on the outside that impact the inside. But this is a dialogical engagement with the conversation with ourself and through a coach this can be immersed in so i'm going to take you through a short experience i would like you if you can i know there's a picture in front of you and i'm going to actually block that out for now and ask you to just close your eyes no not answer the email or the quick whatsapp actually take this time to grant yourself the privilege of checking in with you. Mm. Not a very familiar space, but let's try. Maybe for a few it is. But even I, who am quite practiced, mm, I like that, even I, even I who am practiced in this, when I start slowing down and coming back to myself, I'm surprised by how far I've left myself, how far away I am. So I'd like you to take a deep breath and just drop your eyes or close them, not to fall asleep, but to be fully attentive. Think about what's going on inside of you at the moment. Just pay attention to any feelings, thoughts. When we look at the world through our inner subjective eyes, we are talking about our inner being, our inner truth. No one can challenge that. It's a truth. It's how I feel. It's what I'm thinking. And it's not the only truth of our experience in the world, of our capacity for consciousness in the world. Because there are three other lenses. As you notice you focusing on your thoughts and maybe your feelings, something else will have emerged into your consciousness perhaps. Ah, my body's quite tired. So the physical properties of our body, those are the properties that we can see, we can touch, we can taste. And then we act. The response of our inner world reacts into our outer world in our behaviours. So you can think of the last week to last Wednesday. You've got a nice weekend in between. Was there something that triggered you? What happened inside of you that triggered you? What did you feel? What did you think? And then what was your behavior? How did you act? Now people would see that other truth of yours. They'd be able to see that behavior because you act into the world as an individual. 
So that becomes another truth. And then the third dimension. Who did it impact? What was the quality of the relationship or thing, the relationship with whatever it is that triggered you? That's another dimension. And then what happened in the environment that impacted you? So we've got four lenses onto one thing. Something happened inside. Something happened. You had a response inside. You behaved. You had changed your relationship with someone else. And there was something that probably occurred or you responded to in the environment. So if we go back to our picture, come into the room again if you have your eyes closed and look at these four lenses that any one of us have got as potential for experience in the world. One is that there's an inner side of us, our own particular internal eye. We do have, that shows up in our body and our behavior, another reality, another truth. They're not always congruent. We're also within a culture, showing up within the culture, describing shared meaning. And we're also in a society and the environment where systems and processes and policies all take part in forming our reality. So when we slow down and come into a reflection space or a reflective place, we can start looking at a problem from what's happening inside of me, one truth. What do I need to do? What role do I need to play? What behavior do I need to take? Second truth. Who is involved with this? Who's the we in this? What is the culture we're creating? Third truth. And four, what is happening in the environment and how is the environment affecting me with its systems and processes and policies and procedures? Four truths. Why is this useful? Well, it starts engaging us in conscious choice. Being able to look at our leadership presence, our capacity for our teams and, sh and our shared values, our leadership behaviours and our teamwork, how it shows up in the systems and processes and policies and education and research and um, students and all the complexity. So it's useful to have a map. It's useful to have a tool which can be used as or a framework or a philosophical approach, which for us is about I and the we in an Ubuntu tradition of I am because we are. We are not separate and we are not separate. Our internal self is not separate from the external. Being able to manage all of this really exacerbates our capacity to be aware as a leader, to behave as a leader, the organizational performance of the leader and the team awareness or department or university awareness, whatever the weeness is. And we go through different levels of awareness with that. So again, why is this important? The inner world is important because most of us show up at a personality level. And we behave. You can see my cursor going up and down. And if, if this is what we're doing all the time, showing up just in this space, we never get to release or let go of our defenses or protective capacities. And we don't really explore what other motivations are possible or any of our anxieties, our fears and our needs to change how we show up. So this territory of potential is simply not there until we start exploring it. In the process of doing that, whoops, let me just get rid of that. In the process of doing that, 
we can see how when we are stressed, our physical and emotional stress, our anxiety, our overworrying, starts throwing us into a survival mode. That is a very direct way of being of asking for help here when we're in this kind of space. Or we simply don't. When we are actually taking psychological responsibility for ourselves, we start moving up into a place where we can start accessing our talent and our thinking capacity and feeling capacity. And when we're trying to put in new practices and habits, the coach can really help us take ourselves, not so much from here, perhaps another kind of intervention is needed here, although you can talk about it in a coaching conversation, but it's really to say, how do we accept this? How do we recover? And how do we actually go into a growth mindset? So to do this, we really, I'm skipping one slide, we really need to go into um, giving ourselves time to have conversations that can really, really touch our hearts, that can help support us, that can help ease our overburden because we've got space to think, space to feel and to grow. And being able to grow and continue being able to work with a vertical development, which we, we talk about shifting ways of being and ways of doing, rather than only horizontal development, which is very traditional learning, where we add on more to a knowledge base. Neither one wrong or right, but together both are much more progressive and transformative. Why do we need to work as that as leaders? Hmm. Because any intervention, whether you're a teacher, a researcher, a leader, a community worker, a mom, a friend, a lover, a husband, a wife, what is inside of us is what shows up. So building our conscious awakened presence working with our skilled behavior, engaging with our inner capacities as a team or department or organization, and building those together through all four areas is incredibly important. I'd like to end my part and lead into what Sharon's going to kind of work down through this is giving you some practical aspects to it. So being able to land in the coaching field and benefit from what's been offered to you by the program that Denise is offering and what is happening in all the, the um, support given to leadership and management. This coaching conversation is one that I hope will change your life. This was done by um, one of our alumni for me. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing, close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. step or the third start with the first thing close in the step you don't want to take
Thank you very much, Patty, and a very good afternoon to everyone who's joined us on the call. So while some of you might be curious, trying to understand what is this whole coaching about? How do I take this conversation forward? Where do I even begin? Right. And I know a lot of us have been exposed to coaching, whether we've been coached, whether we've coached or we've heard the term being used all over. And it's so lovely to see some familiar faces, uh, familiar names rather, um, coming in. And it's always such a delight being invited to share with the higher education community. So I'm taking us through a little bit more around the types of coaching that one would be exposed to, all right? And just to unpack some of the commonly known terms that people would encounter as they're being coached, all right? So some of you might have thought, okay, depending on your experience, thinking coaching is about psychotherapy. I am going to be healed. And this is what I often encounter when I say to a coaching client, I'm also a work psychologist. It's like, oh yes, let me tell you the issues that I have. And coaching is not about that. For me, I sincerely believe that the wisdom is already there. My job is to switch on the lights. My job is to be a thinking partner. My job is to walk this journey with you. So some of us who are doing coaching might think it's consulting. In consulting, we're quick to give solutions and advice, and we do a lot of telling. And that's not coaching. And I know we use the term quite loosely, depending on the spaces that we find ourselves. So it's important for all of us on the call to just do a little bit more searching, a little bit more reading to understand this conversation that I'm having. Is it coaching? Are we just having a chat? Is it performance management? What exactly are we doing? And what am I hoping to get out of it? Some people use the term coaching when in fact they're actually teaching, right? And the higher we go up the leadership pipeline, some of us tend to default to a lot of telling. And we say, but I'm coaching. Are we really coaching if we're doing a lot of downloading and telling people what to do, all right? Another commonly used term is around mentorship. Right. And mentorship, I try to think of it as hand holding. I've been there before. I'm guiding you. I'm showing you how this could be done. I am creating an opportunity for you. I'm operating like a sponsor. So for me, mentoring has a specific space. Right. And I hear a lot of leaders who say, we're doing coaching and mentoring all in one breath. And I often wonder. Have we taken the time to unpack and understand what it is we're saying? What is the intention? What are we hoping to achieve at the end of this conversation that we're engaging on? So coaching, as you know, defined by the International Coach Federation, is that coaching is about partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. If we break up that definition, right? We're partnering, number one. I'm not coming in with a blueprint. Yes, I might have a framework that I operate from that guides the type of support I provide, but I don't have all the answers. My job is to create an environment where your best thinking can happen, right? It also talks about a thought provoking and creative process, which means my experience with one coaching client will not be the same with another one. My philosophy over the years has evolved to the point of meeting the client where they are. Sometimes I have a perfect script in my head about how this is going to go. But if we reflect on what Paddy was sharing with us, and I particularly love the quote, around my interior condition, all right? Influencing how I can change the exterior, right? So let me use a metaphor. 
If I am trying to go up a hill, I'm driving a manual car, but I'm going up in the fifth gear, that car is going to cut off. So how do I change the system if I'm operating in the wrong gear? So before I even embark on this coaching journey, before I even take on coaching myself, I need to just press pause and say, where am I? What's going on for me? What are the things that I am noticing about myself? And what is the kind of support that I need? So when we go through that process, it helps us to understand the kind of support we require. Do I need to go into therapy? Do I need to get an expert to guide me on a particular process? Do I need to go and do extra training? Do I need somebody to be a thinking partner and help ignite my best thinking? So moving on, colleagues, I thought let's understand some of the coaching buckets, if I can use that word, to help us understand the type of coaching that one would possibly be exposed to. So you might be exposed to transactional coaching, which really is around an exchange focused relationship, right? The time is limited, the task is clear. And I often think about an athlete, right? You have a clear target, you have clear deliverables. So that's what we're doing. Make sure you give me 10 goals and you're going to get a bonus of X amount, right? So the focus is on performance. And I'll unpack a little bit more in the other slides. Transformational coaching is another bucket that you might be exposed to in terms of your coaching experience or the exposure that you get. And here it's a one-on-one -on -one approach that involves building a trusting coach-client alliance. How are we going to work together? Is this long-term? Is this going to change my life? Is it about the values? Is it about the purpose? Is it about a complete overhaul, right? Am I spring cleaning where I am? All this stuff that no longer serves me. That is the kind of support that I need and you will help me to move from point A to point B. The coaching that I particularly enjoy is transitional coaching. And here is taking people through a journey. So you're going through different processes in your life. You could be changing careers. And if you think about working in an organization and you're moving up the leadership pipeline, so let's take the higher education environment as an example. You're a lecturer, you moved on to being head of department, your department of school, you move on to being the director of school, the dean, the deputy vice chancellor, and maybe you move on to being vice chancellor. All of those transitions you will optimize your performance by having a thinking partner supporting you. You will need someone who holds up the mirror and says, hey, what do you notice? You need someone to think through the stuff that you're going through. So let's take it a little bit deeper in terms of the different buckets that I'm talking about. So with transactional coaching, some of, some of the questions that you might be asked would be around specific tasks, right? So what are the options that you've been thinking about in terms of getting to a 5% increase in your target, right? Wh when do you plan to do that? Give me the timelines. What are some of the challenges that you anticipate you're going to encounter? How might you resolve it if those challenges happen? So the task is clear right? It's about performance. We want to move you from point A to point B. So that in its broadest sense is transactional coaching. And there is a place for it. In the work that you're doing, you might find someone is struggling to publish, right? So you need to make sure they get some money in their research account. You need to make sure that more subsidy comes through in their particular section of the university. So transactional coaching could have a place there where you're focused on the performance and actually articulating the type of performance that you're looking at. Now, transformational coaching is focusing on the individual, right? And as a coach, what I'm communicating to you is that I'm here for you. I'm not only here to grow you as an athlete, for example, but as a whole person, 
So if I think about the shifts that need to happen at a head level, what is my mindset around particular things? What are the behaviors that I need to start thinking about? What are the values that I need to start interrogating? For example, you might be a person who articulates a lot of values about integrity, about you know, working with honesty and transparency, but actually your behavior is not consistent. So you're okay with adjusting the budget. The VC doesn't need to know that we've tweaked the figures, but in all your meetings, you're saying, well, you know what? We need to operate with integrity and honesty. And that could be an area where your coach works with you because it's not only about performance, but it's also touching at your value system. It's also touching at your mindset and it's touching at your whole being as an individual. Another aspect um, or another bucket that I can offer is the transitional coaching. So we are partnering, right? As your coach was saying, right, this is where you are now, but this is not the only stop. The journey is still going. So where to from here? What is that future self that is wanting to emerge? So let's say you've gone through a divorce and now your identity has shifted. You're saying, who am I? Who am I post being a wife? Who am I post being part of this family unit? How do I start shifting my behavior? How do I start shifting my thinking? How do I start believing again? If we take it to the workplace, as your role starts to shift, for some of you, you might have been part of the peer group. Now you're the leader. Now you're part of the us and them dynamic. How do I make that shift? Or if you're thinking about you know, working in a hospital, you used to be the nurse, now you're the hospital matron, but you're still wanting to make the beds, you're still wanting to feed the patients. But at the same time, the Department of Health is saying, what about your indicators? What's going on with that? So you need support to be able to see how your role has shifted and the kind of support that you're going to need. So take a moment to just think for yourself, what is the kind of support I require and what type of coaching would be relevant for me? As we journey through life, different type of coaching will apply. So very quickly, and I'm mindful of the time, a lot of coaching frameworks are available, so many that you can pick from, right? And I thought it would be helpful for us to look at one of the basic or the bedrock or the staple of coaching. Some of you might be familiar with the GROW model. I often think of it like baking a cake, right? So you might know how to make a chocolate cake, you might know how to make red velvet, but you've never baked it before. So before going into the fancy frameworks and trying to do all these experiments. Start at the basic, right? And at your most basic, what is coaching all about? Coaching is about taking me from my current reality. This is where I am now. And this is where I would want to be. So how do I do that? So with the GROW model, we start off with just setting a goal, right? And this is something you can even go and do today, right? So a goal, remember, it has to be smart. So smart, it has to be specific, needs to be measurable, needs to be attainable, needs to be relevant, needs to be time bound, right? So if I'm saying, and let's use a cliche example, I want to lose five kilos before my holiday in December, right? Hmm. So I have a timeline. I have the weight that I want to lose. Fantastic. It's clear. It's measurable. By the time I get to the 1st of December, I need to be able to measure and see if there's been a shift, right? So what is the current reality? Oh, man. Current reality is I am working from home. So the distance between the fridge and my desk is tiny, which means I am just munching all day and I'm an emotional eater. So it's really difficult for me to be able to meet my goal. Okay, so if I use a barometer of one to 10, 10 being I'm really close to achieving my goal, I might say, mm, maybe I'm actually at a two. 
at a two because I have the idea, I've got the gym clothes, and I've got a sign on my door that says, yes, we have to lose five kilos by the 1st of December, 2022. Fantastic. We look through at the options, right? Okay, what are the options that I'm going to take? So number one, I might need to clear out all the snacks. Number two, I might need to cook only enough so that I'm not eating all the leftovers and then having the cake from last night and then having the biscuits and, you know, so maybe I need to just clear out. Another thing could be thinking about it in terms of my whole family and say, if we make a decision as a collective, so this community and this household, we are going to improve the way we eat. We're going to plan our meals on Sunday afternoon. And for the rest of the week, we're very clear on what we're going to eat. Fantastic. Now, the W in the model is saying, so what will I do? So now I need to be able to actually articulate those activities clearly. So every Sunday afternoon at three o'clock, we need to do a meal plan for the day. Okay, who's going to do the meal plan? So mom will do the meal plan, dad will be there and all the kids. So we all do it as a collective. Cool. I need to buy a scale. Okay, by when? I need to buy a scale by the end of the week. I need to go to clicks because I've got a special. So as you just unpack all of those activities, the what you will do becomes a little bit clearer. Now, I add an S in my grow model to say, can I do this alone? What is the kind of support that I need to help me on this journey, right? What are some of the structures that I need to put in place? So maybe I have a gym buddy who calls me every day to say, okay, we're going to go for a run in the park fantastic. I'm going to make sure I take pictures of all the food I'm eating throughout the day and I share it with someone so I have an accountability partner. So without even any training, any of you on the call can take the simple model and just try and set a goal for yourself. I'm not publishing. I'm not able to speak up in meetings, but I'm really frustrated about what's going on. What is the goal that I'm setting? What is the reality? What are my options? What will I do? And what is the support that I have available? So coaching has competencies that we require, right? And if I take it back to the workplace, a lot of this work requires us to listen. So this has been a very helpful model um, for the work that I do. Now, a lot of us listen with the intention to reply. A lot of us listen from a very distracted mind. We've got our phone. We've got stuff we're thinking about. Um, and Patty told us about, you know, stuff is triggering us. What, what is that? So we're going through the world without noticing, all right? And so from a level one listening, we're listening from habit. And I often think about it like this imaginary house okay so work with me people it's an imaginary house there are no windows there are no doors right so whatever I say it keeps bouncing back at me no new information can come through as a leader in your institution how's your listening do you sit in a meeting and you're just yap 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 it's all your stuff right if I'm listening from a level two this is the very argumentative type of listening. So the curiosity is there, but this is what I typically witness in, in parliament. I'm trying to notice where the differences are. So I wanna confirm, is there new data? Okay, so it can be helpful because you're starting to open up your mind and it requires curiosity to do that. Now, the other bit of listening, which is very helpful, especially within coaching, is where we listen from an open heart. We're trying to listen from the other person's perspective, right? It's not to say I need to have experienced it. It's not to say I need to know the right answer. I just need to allow myself to see from the other person's perspective. And another helpful way of looking at an open heart is like wearing a jacket. So if I'm wearing a jacket and my jacket symbolizes my opinion, if I take my jacket off, I don't stop being Sharon. I can pick my jacket up. But in that moment, I'm able to just take my jacket off, 
put it on the side and listen from the other person's perspective. And the last bit of listening is around open will, where I am needing courage to see beyond my stuff, where I'm noticing what's wanting to move through as I speak to the other person. So listening is very important in terms of our coaching work because I need to be curious, I need to be compassionate, and I need to be courageous to hear things that are different from the way that I think. These slides are going to be made available to you and I'm not going to go through all of them because I do notice we are out of time. And one last point that I wanted to make is that as we grow in our awareness, in our leadership, in the work that we do, in just our self-reflection, our ability to deepen the conversation then increases. And the key levers of doing that is curiosity, right? Which requires an open mind, is compassion, which requires an open heart. And it also requires courage. Courage is the hardest because we want to protect ourselves and say, but I don't want to move from my position. So it's everyday work. And to really listen to others, we must first learn to listen to ourselves. So I'm going to stop there and allow Denise to jump in and share with us more of her thoughts. Over to you, Denise. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon, uh, for uh, sharing all of that wisdom and, and, and Paddy before you. Um, so I think that between, between Paddy and Sharon, they have really, um, so fully articulated um, the whys and the hows and the wherefores. So what I want to do is just perhaps give a few examples of the whys of coaching in relation to higher education leadership. Um, and I don't know if you're going to be putting my slides up, uh, Patrick, or whether you want me to do that myself. Um, if you can do it yourself, that'd be great. Okay, do I have the share screen uh, capability? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'll do that now. And Okay, so, so what I want to go through just in, in a few minutes is really the coaching in or for higher education leadership in particular. And the first part of that is, of course, why coaching in higher education specifically? Um, we've heard, I think, just really so fully explicated um, why coaching is different. But why in higher education? And I have some particular reasons why I think in higher education it is particularly pertinent um, and particularly um, critical kind of support, um, especially for those who are moving up in the system. Uh, Sharon gave an example of how you move from being a lecturer, you've come into higher education because of your discipline, because you want to share what you know about it. But then you find yourself moving up, up in rank, because you're becoming more and more knowledgeable, the horizontal movement, uh, which is also vertical in a sense that Paddy was talking about. But you also find that as you move up, those pots, those bowls become bigger, but they also become less populated. The less populated, you are far more alone. You are finding yourself really having to think very carefully about who you share with. You are seeing things from a much broader perspective. Um, the bowl is bigger because it encompasses more responsibility. And then the question becomes, well, who do I talk to? You can't talk to those above you because they put you there to solve the problems, to take care of that department, that faculty, that portfolio. If you talk to those who report to you, you could be, uh, you know, you, you could be, you could be erring on the side of um, going against confidentiality, uh, being seen as favoring some people, and so on. 
So the challenges become more complex. You are having to think far more broadly, far more deeply about so many more things. You're having to use your brain in different ways. You're having to not only cognitively think about the issues, you're also having to think about how it affects people. You're having to think about people's circumstances. And you're having to think about your own reactions to the people and the situations and their behaviors. But essentially, you remain a human being, dealing with other human beings in order to get the work done. Often, you find that these aspects of your humanity actually get lost and overshadowed. All these things that all of us are, that are captured in this, in this graphic, your ability to be joyful and creative and fluid and visionary, uh, your ability to be honest and perceptive, uh, to be humble, uh, observant, energetic, to be patient, tenacious, all of those things become really stretched because you're the boss. You're responsible for everything. You are expected to know how everything works. You are expected not to make mistakes. You're expected to know all the answers to all the questions. You are expected to sort things out. You are expected to come up with all the solutions. You're expected to hold the purse strings. You're expected to fill the purse. And there's no sense that the purse is actually not yours. You're just holding it for the organization in that little department or in that faculty. Uh, you're expected to not have a life outside of your work. You're expected to not have vulnerabilities. And, and, and. So this whole issue of being the heart, being the boss, having all of humanity present with you, from your head, through to your heart, through to your gut. This is the challenge. And the question is, when you're sitting, feeling completely overwhelmed, who do you call? It's not Ghostbusters. Um, I'm showing my age. There used to be a movie, Ghostbusters, and the line was, who do you call? Ghostbusters. Well, Ghostbusters are not going to do it. Um, who do leaders talk to, to get the support they may need? And I think here in this graphic of these two faces, often you may be sent to go for coaching. And often that coach is called a coach, but actually doesn't necessarily hold the qualities or have the training to really be able to move you from where you are to where you want to be. Often you'll find coaches who are sitting, uh, and excuse me, there's anybody in HR, I don't mean this against HR in general, but often it's about performance management. It's about saying you've got to do the following things or else you are often put in it because you're being managed out of your position or managed into a disciplinary uh, process. And that's not the kind of coaching that's not how we want to think about coaching. We really have to think about coaching and the approach of a coach in the ways that Paddy and Sharon have spoken about. You're looking for a coach as someone who can be open, who will be really interested in you, who will be open to really listening to what it is you are experiencing with the greatest of confidentiality, not reporting back to your boss or to HR or to uh, your peers. Someone who's really curious, who expresses that curiosity about why are you feeling the way you are? Why are you doing the things you're doing? And who can be honest with what they see. They hold a mirror up to you, but not in a way that is brutal. You know, you've heard the term brutal honesty. Well, that's not what we're looking for in a coach. We're looking for a coach who will enlarge your perspectives, who will say, okay, so... You're coming at this from this particular perspective. This is what I hear you saying. How are you actually showing up, given that this is how you're feeling? How are you in that meeting? And then we'll ask you questions about what does this mean in terms of the relationships? 
when people see you do this? And what is the effect on the systems that you are a part of? By the way, what are all the systems you are a part of? Besides your work and your office, what's happening at home? And so on. So it's about enlarging perspectives and both pushing and clarifying those boundaries. But importantly, it's about changing old habits, which is what got you into the situation you find yourself in when you called for, for help or called for a listening ear and finding new ways of being. So how coaching can and has been used in higher education it can and has been used badly uh, in terms of performance management, in terms of managing people out of positions, in terms of disciplining people, and particularly in the case of often emerging leaders in, uh, the, in, in, in terms of equity and diversity saying, okay, they're not quite ready yet, maybe they can do with a coach. And all of that has been given, has given coaching sometimes a really bad name. However, coaching can and has also been used in higher education to develop and to transform. And in HALM, we have started incorporating coaching into our programs in order to provide exactly the kind of support that helps people grow and transform. All coaching is about learning um, and therefore, and I think all learning is about transforming. Um, changing how you think, changing how you are, changing how you behave. And the first thing with coaching in the programs that we've been part of in Helm and also in various institutions, many of you sitting in the, in the chat room are in fact people who have perhaps been in coaching programs. I know I see quite a few of you there who are in the coaching programs that we are currently involved with. And it starts with you as a leader. Uh, and, you know, we're all leaders in our different ways. Developing self-awareness of who you are, of how you are, of how you show up and why. How do you want to be? What do you want? And how can you get there? It is also about developing an understanding yourself and others yourself in relation to others, and then developing understanding of yourself in relation to systems. And in fact, all of the above, to see these as being involved in an integral relationship with each other, how you are, how you act, how you develop relationships with others on the basis of that, and then how these in turn affect your department, your systems that you are part of the university uh, in this case, all of those are part of our coaching can actually be of use in higher education. But to end, I must say that it goes all the way back to that original um, question that I asked, why is it particularly important in higher education? And I think it's because we are often on our own. Uh, when it comes to dealing with problems and issues, especially in leadership positions. We are expected to be that boss. And who do we talk to without feeling that we are giving away or making ourselves vulnerable in ways that people refer to as career limiting? And I think coaching and a coaching environment provides a safe space and a confidential space within which to really look at yourself to really look at how you are behaving, to be vulnerable, and then to face those vulnerabilities and look at how to share them. So um, that's what I want to say. That's all I want to say for now. And we hope that there'll be lots of questions and also contributions from people who are in um, this webinar, in the Zoom room, to show how they've experienced it. Thank you very much, Birgit, and thanks to my colleagues. Denise, thank you very much. Um, Patrick, if you can spotlight Paddy and Sharon as well, then the four of us um, are visible. And um, I wanted just to see if I've got um, any questions in the chat. I didn't see any. Um, but for me, what was so striking was that comment on that we fail to notice what we fail to notice, literally that. 
and how limited we are in our in our visual field and how you know we see things precisely I see from my vantage point and how limited and how small and how narrow my lens is and um, it's very good to be reminded of my limitations and, and it's really good to do that um, I'm gonna mute somebody up there it is um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to add about that is that when I consider another person's version of me or vision of me, I grant that they have a voice and a right and a, and a validity to their perception of me. So it's not just me of a situation, but that I need to know my limitations and in that way enable others and give the platform to others to have their version that is equally valid as mine is. And I think that that really has been a reminder to me. So thank you very much. I want to see if there's something in chat quickly. Um, I know that everybody's asking me for the presentations and we will have a recording um, and the PowerPoints, of course, shared with you. I just want to see Denise and Sharon and Patty, if you've got questions of each other, perhaps um, there is something that stood out for you of each other's um, presentation. You know, <clears throat> what um, stood out for me wasn't anything about the presentation so much as that the three of us, although um, I, I don't I know Sharon from working together somewhere, but we don't have all that much to do outside of here and our, our relationship is beginning. And Denise, you, you're in our, my relationship has been over a couple of years, but it's also sporadic. And yet as coaches, we can connect in a common language that enables us to share things although we didn't practice hugely between us in terms of you know exactly what was going to be said there is something common between us which just gives me such um it gives us a common language of humanity with which we can meet each other and that that for me was just again so so evident so thank you Sharon's just giving us a heart Yes, a heart of gratitude to say, yes, hear, hear, agreed. And I think, colleagues, the world is shifting in terms of coaching. And while cost used to be prohibitive, the encouraging thing is that within coaching, there's so many innovations coming through. There's email coaching. They're just like different ways to create spaces for people to talk to someone. There's spaces being created for leaders to have a thinking partner. So imagine if each and every leader on the African continent had a coach, what would become possible if we stop doing and start being as humans, imagine what becomes possible. So if there's an opportunity to get a coach, please sign up, find someone to think with you. The world is so much nicer with the thinking partner. So thank you so much for this opportunity today. Thank you, Sharon. Denise, any closing words? Or let me, before I, Denise. Yes, I saw. Can I see? I saw there was a hand up, yeah. No, it's and not. It's, like the, the, it's a hand, but it's also um, Mamotena at, um, asked, who should initiate the process? How do you feel about that? Does anybody want to say something there? The coach? So, so I'm going to jump in and say what I would like to say at the same time and, and, and maybe also respond to that question, which, which my colleagues may want to do as well. Um, the first is that I think coaching has not been a first go-to when people have come with um, the experience of being just overwhelmed, and stepping into, into that new position. You know, in, in, in higher education in particular, um, I think you don't get trained to move up from what is an academic uh, um, a position of teaching and research into becoming a leader and manager. And suddenly you've got to deal with all of this, which of course you're capable of learning how to do, but the people issues that come with it and how that affects you and your way of being and how your way of being affects being a leader within, uh, within that team, that never gets addressed. You just have to fly by the seat of your pants, make mistakes, make enemies often, make faux pas and then pick yourself up and just carry on. So I think the whole issue of actually asking for that support from your line manager, from HR to say, please can't I get a coach? There are budgets in universities. 
for staff development. Often those budgets get placed on sending you on a course. Sending you on a course may be useful to learn how to financial budgeting or whatever, but it doesn't develop you inside. And that is the part, the interior that Paddy was talking about, that Sharon was talking about, how you develop yourself, your strength, your resilience, all of those things happen within the partnership with a coach. And so the question, the answer to your question is, ask your line manager, please, can I get a coach? There are many of them out there. I want a good one. I want a qualified one. I don't want somebody who's only going to performance manage me into uh, something, but I want somebody who's going to help me grow. And so that's what I would like to say um, as a last word as well. Thanks, Berg. Denise, thank you very much. Um, there was a question of, um, um, we wish we would all get this opportunity and perhaps I can emphasize that it's also about something we need to drive ourselves. We want to take that opportunity. So we need to go to our colleagues, our friends, you know, come to us in Helm and speak to Denise and I or to Sharon and Paddy. You've got their details and say, how do I do this? I want this relationship. I want to broaden the lens about myself, understand my blind spots and become a better and more present person. So um, I know our time is going. It's gone past quarter past three. And I want to close today with a rather longer thank you because it is our last engage for the year. First of all, a most heartfelt thank you to my speakers, to our speakers here. It's like I've had a bit of a coaching experience myself. It's like gathering myself towards myself. Um, and this has been our attention with this theme as a closing scene for Engage for this year. So thank you very much, Paddy and Sharon and Denise. And I know you're all available. If somebody wants to reach out or bounce some thoughts, um, your details have been shared with everybody in the room. Well, thank you all here in the room for participants. So many of you joining us today, many of you are our monthly participants at our USAF Helm Engage series. And we appreciate you being with us. As always, you find all our resources on the Helm site, on the YouTube channel, and we're sending you the PowerPoints from today. A special thanks also to Patrick Fish, who's been my partner in this project, who I appreciate very much, and who's con contributed immeasurably behind the scenes. A special thank you also to our director, Oliver Seal, without whom this would not have been possible. Also to Michelle, Denise, of course, on the Helm team, Cindy, and all the other colleagues on the Helm team with a positive energy and generous spirit and presence throughout this year. A special thank you to Yusa and its leadership, especially Professor Ahmed Bawa, who's prioritizing national engagements of this kind. And um, he's making it possible that we have these kinds of platforms. So thank you very much to you, Professor Ahmed Bawa. Just a quick glimpse to next year. We're starting next year again at the end of February and early March. Um, the dates we're setting, um, we're looking at it. And we are likely to start with Professor Kupana Ratele. He will examine masculinity and the pleasures and the poisons of masculinity and how it impacts on leadership in our country and in Africa. Until then, have a wonderful end of the year. Be healthy and safe and well. Until we see each other again in February or March 2023. Until then, take good care. Goodbye, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. On. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Much appreciated. Bye. Bye, Kerry. Bye, Kerry. Bye, Liz. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh, look at Liz. Hi. 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 Yes, Safi. <laughs> Hi, Safi. I'll see you later, Matilda. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, Lindy. Bye, John. I saw him on the. I think it was fall. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Bye, Bye Lisa. Lisa. <laughs> hi, Bye -bye. hi, colleagues. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, 
is this helm one the one which is going to end on the seventh no this is a helm um we have an engaged series which is a monthly online